And now we'll be hearing uh, Father Timothy Ratliff, uh, Radcliffe. This morning I, I want to talk about authority. It's a crucial element for understanding what a synod is, what the church is. I think so much misunderstanding about the nature of the synod, the nature of the life of the church, comes from two narrow political executive understanding of authority. And part of the adventure of the synod will be seeing how we walk with a much richer, diverse understandings of authority. There can be no fruitful conversation between us unless we recognize that every one of us speaks with authority. We are all baptized in Christ, priest, prophet, and king. The International Theological Commission of the Church produced a marvelous document on the census fide. And they begin by quoting St. John, you have been anointed by the Holy One and all of you have knowledge. The anointing you have received from Christ abides in you and you do not need anyone to teach you. His anointing teaches you about all things. Many lay people have been astonished during the preparation for this synod to find that they are listened to for the first time in their lives, perhaps, that they have authority. And they've been asking, so often it says in the Instrumentum Laboris, can I really offer something? But it's not just the laity who felt a loss of authority. The whole church is. Uh, an archbishop from Asia complained to me that he had no authority. He said, I quote, the priests are all independent barons. They don't take any notice of me at all. And many priests complain that they've got no authority, especially because of the sexual abuse crisis. They're discredited. We are discredited. But our whole world is suffering from a crisis of authority. All institutions are losing authority. Politicians, the law, the press have all felt authority draining away. Authority always seems to belong to somebody else. Dictators who are increasingly taking power in our world. Parts of the new media, celebrities, influencers. And the world hungers for a voice that speaks with authority about the meaning of our lives. And dangerous voices threaten to fill the vacuum. We live in a world which is powered and structured not by authority, but by contracts. Even in the family, the university, the church. So how can the church, how can we recover authority and speak to our world which longs for a word that rings true? Luke tells us that when Jesus taught they were astounded at his teaching because he preached with authority. He commands demons and they obey. Even the wind and the sea obey him. He has the authority to summon his old friend Lazarus to return to, li to life. Lazarus, come out to me. And almost the final words of Matthew's Gospel all authority on heaven and earth are given to me. 
But halfway through the Synoptic Gospels, we have a most massive crisis of authority, compared with which what we are living seems nothing. He tells his closest friends they must come with him to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And basically they say no. Peter rejects it. He will not go. So Jesus takes them up the mountain for this retreat as we are on retreat so that they may discover again his authority. Listen to him. And it's an authority which touches their ears, their eyes, their hearts, their minds, their imagination. Now they have joy. As Ty de Chardin famously said, joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. This is the joy that Madre Maria Gracia talks about so beautifully this morning. Mary's joy. Without joy, none of us have any authority at all. No one believes a miserable Christian. In the Transfiguration, this joy comes from three sources, three authorities, you might say. In the Instrumentum Laboris, they are our beauty, goodness, and truth. In the Instrumentum Laboris, other forms of authority are stretched the authority of the poor, the authority of tradition, the authority of the hierarchy with its ministry of unity. But what I want to stress this morning is how authority is multiple, mutually enhancing, without rivalry. There's no competition between these forms of authority as if the laity can have more authority only at the expense of the bishops, or the conservatives more authority only at the expense of the so-called progressives. We might be tempted to call down fire on those who we see as opposed to us, like the disciples in the gospel today. But in the Trinity, there's no rivalry, there's no competition any more than there is between the four Gospels. And we shall speak with authority to our hungry world, our lost world, if in this synod we transcend competitive ways of existing. Then the world will recognize the voice of the shepherd who summons us to life. So let us look briefly, far too briefly, at this scene on the mountain and see how different forms of authority interact. First of all, there is beauty, as often in life. First, there is beauty. In Hebrew, beauty, glory are much the same. Bishop Robert Barron said somewhere, forgive me, Bishop Barber, if I misremember or misquote you, that beauty can reach people who reject or are afraid of other forms of authority. A moral vision might be perceived as moralistic. How dare you tell me how to live my life? The authority of doctrine may be wrongly perceived as oppressive. How dare you tell me what to think? But beauty has an authority which touches our intimate freedom. That's why for many it is the beginning. Beauty opens our imagination 
to what is transcendent, the homeland which we have never seen but for which we long. The Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins called God beauty's self and beauty's giver. Aquinas, to balance things a bit, Aquinas says beauty reveals the end of the journey as the target is the aim of the archer. No wonder Peter doesn't know what to say. Beauty carries us beyond words. It's been claimed that every adolescent has some experience of transcendent beauty. If they do not have guides, as the disciples had Moses and Elijah on the mountain, they will not know what to make of it. When I was a 16-year-old boy at a Benedictine school, for which I give thanks always, I had such a moment in the great Abbey Church, and I had wise monks to help me understand. Not all beauty speaks of God. The Nazi leaders loved classical music. On the feast day of the Transfiguration, an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in a tragic parody of the divine light. Beauty can deceive. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful on the outside but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And the divine beauty will finally shine outside the city on the cross. God's beauty is disclosed most radiantly in what seems most ugly. And one must go to the places of suffering to glimpse God's beauty most radiantly. Translators, I will just add a little bit here. I went to Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I think it was in early 1993. It was a terrible time of conflict and war. Kinshasa was almost surrounded. It was impossible to leave the city. And then we went to Mass. And already in the sacristy, people were beginning to sing and to dance. And it was like a great light that was lit in the darkness. And the darkness could not put it out. And I often feel my dear brothers and sisters from Africa, we need you to help us to celebrate, to teach us how to sing and how to dance. It struck me in that Mass that day in Kinshasa, why have I never danced at Mass before? <laughs> Etty Hillesum, Jewish mystic, drawn to Christianity, found beauty even in Auschwitz. She said, I want to be there in the thick of what people called horror and still be able to say, life is beautiful. Every renewal of Christianity has gone with an aesthetic renewal. Orthodox iconography, Latin Gregorian chant, Counter-Reformation Baroque, I must say, which rather leaves me cold. Methodist hymns in the 19th century. And the Reformation was in part a, a parting of ways of aesthetic vision. What aesthetic renewal do we need to open a glimpse of transcendence, especially in places of desolation, and suffering and death. 
how can we disclose the beauty of the cross? When the Dominicans first arrived in Guatemala in the 16th century, they couldn't go up into the mountains to preach to the indigenous people who were fierce. The army wanted to come to protect them. But the brethren said no. They taught beautiful songs to the traveling merchants, Christian songs, who went before them and prepared the way. The songs opened the way for the missionaries to arrive peacefully, without any soldiers, which is why it is still called to this day Vera Paz, true peace. And when the soldiers came, they killed many of the indigenous people and the brethren too. So what songs can enter this new continent, which is the continent of the young? Who are their musicians, their poets, their artists? There's a Korean Dominican painter I love called Kim En Yong, who paints these wonderful white canvases colored with abstract colors. He gave me one for my office in Rome. I took my mother in to see it. I said, isn't it wonderful? And she looked at it skeptically. And she said, it looks like your habit after a dirty breakfast. <laughs> Beauty opens the imagination to the end of the journey. We may be tempted, like Peter, therefore, to stop and to stay. Other forms of authority are necessary to bring us down the mountain and set off on the first synod to Jerusalem. The disciples are offered two interpreters, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, holiness and truth. So Moses, holiness, goodness. Moses led Israel out of slavery into freedom. But the Israelites did not want to go. They hungered for the safety of Egypt. They feared the freedom of the desert. Just as the disciples feared to make the journey to Jerusalem. Just as some of us naturally are afraid to walk in the way of the synod. In Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, the Grand Inquisitor asserts, nothing has ever been more insufferable for humanity than freedom. In the end, they will lay down their, f their freedom at our feet and say, better that you enslave us, but feed us. Saints have the authority of courage. They dare to bid us follow them on the road to life. They invite us to come on the risky journey to holiness. St. Benedicta of the Cross was born into an observant Jewish family. She became an atheist when she was a teenager. But then she picked up the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. She read it all night. And then she said, when I finished the book, I said to myself, this is true. This led her to religious life and to death in Auschwitz. That's the authority of holiness. It bids us leave control of your life. Be brave. The most popular book of the 20th century was by J.R.R. Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings. It's a deeply Catholic novel. He claimed it was the romance of the Eucharist. And the martyrs were the earliest authorities in the church because they boldly gave everything. G.K. Chesterton said, courage is almost a contradiction in terms. 
It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. Are we afraid of that adventure? Herbert McCabe, my next door neighbor, said, if you love, you will get hurt. You may even be killed. But if you don't love, you're dead already. Michael Anthony Perry, former Minister General of the Franciscans, said, in baptism we have renounced the right to fear. I would say perhaps we've renounced the right to be enslaved by fear. The courageous, too, are often afraid. But we only shall have authority in our fearful world if we're seen to risk everything. 400 years ago, our ancestors were sent as missionaries to places like Asia, Africa, Latin America. Half of them died on the way of shipwreck, piracy, disease, but still they went. Would we dare or would we invoke, invoke health and safety? Henri Bourin de Rogier was a friend of mine, a French Dominican lawyer who worked in the Amazon. He took to court the great landowners who often enslaved the poor, forcing them to work on their great estates and killing them if they fled. Henri received innumerable death threats. The police said they would give him police protection. He refused it because he knew it was the police who would probably kill him. I stayed with him one night and he offered me his room. The next day he said he couldn't sleep all night in case they tried to kill him that night and got me by mistake. <laughs> so the authority of beauty speaks of the end of the journey, the homeland we've never seen. The authority of holiness speaks of the journey to, made, to be made if we are to arrive. It's the authority of those who give their lives away. And finally, Elijah. Truth. The prophets are the truth tellers. Elijah saw through the fantasies of Baal and heard the still small voice on the mountain. Veritas. It was that motto that drew me to the Dominican order even before I ever met a Dominican, which may have been providential. The world has fallen out of love with truth. Fake news, wild assertions on the internet, crazy conspiracy theories, yet buried in humanity is that deep instinct for truth which cannot be totally extinguished. And when we speak with truth, it will have some resonance in people's hearts, some authority. The instrumentum laboris is unafraid to be truthful about the challenges that we face in this synod. It speaks openly about our hopes, sorrows, anger, and joy. How can we draw anyone to the one who is the truth if we're not truthful about ourselves? Let me mention very briefly two ways in which this prophetic tradition of truth-telling is urgently needed. First of all, in speaking the truth about the joys and sorrows of this world. In Hispaniola, Bartolomé de las Casas had been leading a life of mediocrity when he read the sermons of Antonio de Montesinos in Advent 1511, confronting the conquistadors with their enslavement of the indigenous people. 
He said, tell me by what right or by what interpretation of justice do you keep these people in such cruel and horrible servitude? By what authority have you waged such detestable wars against people who were once living quietly and peacefully in their lands? As Gas has read it, he knew it was true. He repented. If we speak truthfully about the sufferings of people in this world, in this synod, we shall have some authority. For truth, we also need disciplined scholarship, which resists our temptation to bend the word of God or the teachings of the church for our own purpose. God must be right because he agrees with me. Biblical scholars, for example, bring us back to the original texts of God's word in their foreignness, their otherness. When I was in hospital for this operation for cancer, a nurse said to me that he wished he had learnt Latin so that he could read the Bible in the original language. <laughs> I said nothing. True scholars oppose our any simplistic attempt to enlist the scriptures or the teaching of the church for my personal campaign. God's word belongs to God. Listen to him. We don't own the truth. The truth owns us. All love opens us to the truth of the other. We discover how they remain in some sense unknowable. We cannot take possession of them or use them for our own purposes. We love them in their otherness. So on the mountain of the transfiguration, we see different forms of authority evoked to lead the disciples beyond that great crisis of authority of Caesarea Philippi. All of these are necessary. Without truth, beauty can be vacuous. Somebody said, I forget who, beauty is to truth as deliciousness is to food. Without goodness, beauty can deceive. Without goodness, truth collapses into sentimentality. Truth without goodness leads to the Inquisition. St. John Henry Newman spoke beautifully of the multiple forms of authority, governance, reason, and experience. We all have authority, but we have it differently. Newman said that if the authority of government becomes absolute, it will be tyrannical. If the authority of reason becomes absolute, we fall into arid rationalism. If religious experience is the only authority, then we collapse into superstition. So a synod is like an, an orchestra with different instruments having their own music, which is why the Jesuit tradition of discernment is so essential for the functioning of the synod. Pope Francis has taught us that. Truth is not arrived at by a majority vote any more than an orchestra or a football team is directed by voting. Though vote we must. The authority of the hierarchy is surely in ensuring that the conversation is fruitful, that no voice dominates and drowns out the other. It discerns the hidden harmony, the unity of our deliberations with those of the church throughout the world and throughout time. Jonathan Sachs of Great Britain wrote, in turbulent times there's an almost overwhelming temptation 
for religious leaders to be confrontational. Not only must the truth be proclaimed, but falsehood must be denounced. Choices are set out as stark divisions. Not to condemn is to condone. But the chief rabbi said, a prophet hears not only one imperative, but two, guidance and compassion, a love of the truth, and an abiding solidarity with those for whom the truth has become eclipsed. To preserve tradition, and at the same time to defend those others condemn, is the difficult, necessary task of leadership in an unreligious age. To conclude, all power comes from our triune God in whom all power is shared. The Italian theologian Leonardo Pari asserted, the Father shares his power with everyone and he configures all power as shared. It's no longer possible to quote St. Paul there's no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but you're all one in Christ and appeal to synodality without recognizing that this means finding historical, concrete forms so that each one is recognized as having the power entrusted to him or her. If the church becomes truly a community of mutual empowerment, we shall speak with the authority of the Lord. Becoming such a church will be painful and beautiful. And that's what we look at in the last conference. Thank you. We've been hearing uh, Father Timothy Peter Joseph Ratcliffe giving a meditation for this morning uh, to the retreatants gathered here in Sacrofano in preparation for the Synod. He will begin his second meditation at 11.30 Rome time, which we will also be carrying live, so we invite you back for that. Laudator Jesus Christus, praised be Jesus Christ.